everybody, this is a good friend of mine, uh, Billy. Billy has got an incredible story. Um, Billy, if you're open to it, I'd love to see if you give us a little time for Q&A. Uh, his story, his attitude is amazing. Uh, where every time I listen to him, it, it's just not, you know, I like inspiring, but he's definitely inspiring. But more than anything, I want inspiring and then have it do something for me on a regular basis. What he's going to do for you, he's going to help you see how I'm going to I'm going to beat you up. How how ungrateful you have been sometimes and myself as well. So um, I, he's just an amazing, lovely soul. And Billy, I'm going to turn this over to you, my friend. Fire away. Just, you know, chit chat a little bit about your story. Anything about how we've met, discuss whatever, whatever you want to talk about, but definitely your story. OK, great. Thank you, Gary, for having me on here. You know, such a great honor to be able to share my story with everybody and you know, everybody that sees me. They want to hear my story. And, you know, my story, you know, started out, you know, at an early age when I was two years old. We were traveling Fourth of July weekend uh, with the family. Uh, I live in Alabama. We were traveling to Texas where my dad worked and all the kids were in the back of the car, long station wagon asleep. Mom and dad were driving and uh, unknown to us was an 18 wheeler driver behind us. He'd been driving for several days without sleeping, taking speed pills. You know, he fell asleep at the wheel and he ran over the back of the car and the car went over into a ditch and immediately burst into flames. And, you know, my mom and dad couldn't get to me. Uh, they were able to get my sister out, but me and my cousin was still trapped in the back. And, you know, once the fire department got there, they pulled my cousin out. He was about 30 percent burned, but I was still inside the car because I'd fell. Uh, left side of my body was in the gas tank uh, on fire. So they just assumed like, you know, most firemen, he's probably dead. And my mom said, you know, dead or alive, I want my baby out of the car. And they got me out. Uh, and all I remember from this is being taken to the helicopter uh, to fly me out uh, from that. You know, I had burns, you know, over 65% of my body, my face, my back, my arms, um, broken bones throughout my body, my neck, my back. Um, they, they flew me to a local hospital. The local hospital felt like I would probably just die because of the severity. Really wasn't a lot they could yeah. do. Um, and they told my mom that. My mom said, you know, you really don't make that decision. There's a higher, a higher God that I believe in that's going to take care of my baby. And, you know, from that, they had to make a quick decision. Uh, to amputate my fingers, my left hand, they had to take all my fingers off. And I remember when they took them off, I came out of surgery and I felt this pain and I, uh, I cried to my mom and I said, mom, they cut my fingers off and I made them unwrap it right there. And it was just this big ball. And it just, uh, you know, I was just short of three years old. And I remember them making them take me back into surgery right then because I didn't want just a big club hand. And I made them cut a grip to where I could actually use my hand. And they took me back in there. And I remember my mom telling me, just like it was yesterday, she said, baby, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Uh, and I had to learn how to do everything. You know, it broke my hips, my back, my neck. I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to write again. I was originally left-handed, which is the hand that they had to take the fingers off of. So I had to learn now to use my right hand, which later in life played, played really good in soccer because I was able to use both feet. Uh, because I was a natural lefty. And now I had to learn how to do stuff on my right side. Uh, but, you know, so I went nine months and you know, I spent at the Shriners burn unit, you know, over a hundred surgeries, just trying to, you know, get things right. Uh, and as you grow over time, you know, there's a lot of more surgeries that you got to follow up through. So I spent every spring break, Christmas break, summer break, not at the beach, even though I live close to the beach and I love the beach, but I spent it going to get more surgeries because as you grow, your skin gets tight, it gets constricted and they have to go and, and make changes. But I learned at an early age that people can be different. People will treat you different. People will judge you based on your looks. You know, we talk about through the world, you know, discrimination, you know, I've experienced it my whole life uh, being discriminated against a, because I look different B because they consider me disabled you know, so I've dealt with all that. I, I remember going in a grocery store four years old and I had this mask on that I had to wear to keep my scars compressed, kind of look like pantyhose. And I remember a, a grown lady coming up to my mom and saying, would you take your son out of the store? Because we don't like the way he looks. And of course, my mom being a typical strong mom said, well, if you don't like it, ma'am, you leave the store. We're not going to leave. You know, so we went through that time and that moment of, you know, me realizing that people can be mean. I remember showing up to kindergarten, real excited, my first day of school. 
had the, I don't know if you guys remember the real metal lunch boxes that had Superman. So I was ready to go. I had the thermos in there and I showed up and the principal met my mom at the door and said, your son can't go to school here. Blocked the doorway and said, because he's considered disabled, he's not allowed to go to public school. This was a year prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And my mom told that principal, said, Mr. Principal, if my son doesn't go to school today, then I'm going to stay in here and nobody's going to school today. So he made an exception and said, well, we'll let him go to school here. So I started going to school there and, you know, everybody was loving, you know, supportive until about fourth, fifth grade kicks in. Then you really start to see people shift. They start to treat you different. They start to call you names. You know, I would get called, you know, Freddy Krueger. You know, the the guy from Friday the 13th, you know, I've heard all these stories, burnt charcoal. Well, I thought as an early age, how did I resolve that? Well, I was just getting fights. I would just hit them in the mouth. And, uh, you know, that was back in the time when you got in trouble at school. Guess what you got when you got home? You got in more trouble. I begged them, please don't call my mom, you know, because I need what was waiting on me at home. But that, that's kind of life I was living. Uh, but then I decided I wanted to play sports. Imagine that, a guy with three, three and a half fingers, now I want to play sports. But I had a guy, you never know when uh, a certain person or an angel is going to come into your life to shift your whole life. There was a guy coming, we moved, uh, you know, because my dad, when I was three years old, I left this part out, left me in the burn unit. Said he didn't want a son who had been burned and, and never came back. And I remember seeing my hero walk away and never coming back. And that shattered my whole life as a kid. And then my mom, when I was six, married my stepdad. Uh, we moved there. He was a very um, violent person. He was abusive to my mom. He was abusive to me uh, physically, emotionally, you know, would, would tell you, you know, that you'll never be anything in life. And I remember standing on a dirt road, the Alabama, Florida line went through our front yard. And I remember probably the age of 10 looking down that road, and being told every day you'll never be anything, you're you'll never amount to anything. You should, you know, you shouldn't be here. And I looked at that dirt road and I said, I don't know where or how or when, but one day I'm going to go down that road and I'm going to share my message with the world. That was at ten years old. So I had a vision that was bigger than my situation. So I want you to to hear what I just said. I had a vision that was bigger than my current situation. We lived in a old raggedy trailer. I remember my mom paid with food stamps at the grocery store. I remember having to leave bread out to keep the big wrath from eating our furniture. We had nothing, but I had a vision. And I told my mom at 12, after my dad had physically abused me, I was black and blue. I said, mom, it's either him or us. And she, thank goodness, you know, chose us and we moved. We went back to Alabama to where we came from. And as we're moving into our new house, there was a gentleman hooking in our phone lines. Who remembers the old corded phones that you had in your house before cell phones, where they actually had to come to your house, hook up your phone? And it was a guy named uh, Mr. Charles Bankster, uh, rest of soul. He's passed on over the last couple of years. He said, hey, I'm a local football coach, 12-year-old football coach. Why don't you come play football? I never thought about playing sports, but every day I was out in the yard prior to this, throwing the football up on the roof, catching it. So that's how I learned how to use my hands and catch using my body. I said, sure, sign me up. I'll be there. And I remember showing up the first day. The head coach came out and told my mom, said, I don't think your son needs to play. We're afraid he'll get injured. And her response to him was, said, well, sir, I'm afraid that my son may injure somebody else because his sister is redheaded. And I think she tries to kill him every day. So he's very tough. So I knew I wasn't going to be the, even though I know you're looking, you're thinking, wow, he has great quarterback looks, but I knew I wasn't going to be the star quarterback, but I knew I liked to hit and I liked to kick. So I started you know, being a linebacker, started kicking the football. And from that, you know, got a part of that and rolled into high school and, became a part of our first ever soccer team at our high school and, and our football team went undefeated our senior year. Now I wasn't going to be the all American or the all-star, but it's amazing years later in life when you realize how many people inspired that you motivated by, you know, I'd go have certain. And then when I would come back, you know, I'd 
back onto the field with stitches and staples in my body, but I would just wrap it up and keep going. So, you know, from that, you know, finding out, you know, that you can have an impact in life and, you know, went on to college and, you know, later in life got married, you know, met a beautiful soul and, you know, everything was going good. We had uh, some real estate holdings. We had some rentals. We were doing flips. We had a real estate company. And then something drastic happened in our life, and it was Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina came in and washed away a lot of houses. You know, and from that shift, I started quickly becoming the guy that I was not destined to be. I started uh, living in this story of poor pedal for me, blaming other people, even though we had just lost over a million dollars worth of real estate, you know, gone from the storm. Uh, we knew we had hit rock bottom when we had to move in with the in-laws. Now, look, I love my in-laws, but if you need motivation, move in with your in-laws, you'll get motivated really quick. But I started just hanging around the wrong people. Imagine this. I started becoming like the three people I hung out with the most, you know, hanging out, staying out late at night, being around the wrong crowd, hanging out at the wrong places. And my wife told me, said, you're not the person that I married. You're not the guy that you know, you said you were going to be, and I didn't know what to do. I just felt lost. So I started checking around people that were successful and said, you know, what are you doing? And they say, you need to go see this guy named Tony Robbins. I'd never heard of Tony Robbins other than I knew he was part of a movie called Shallow How. And I went to an event, um, didn't have the means to go. Uh, we went from, you know, living in a house on the hill, being financially independent and being broke mentally, physically, financially, everything. So I said, I'll go. I'll sleep in my car, whatever I got to do. So I went down to the event in Orlando, Florida. And that event changed my life. I went there and I started helping this group uh, of people that were handicapped. It's, just, it's always my nature just to help people. So I started helping them, getting them chairs and just hanging out with them. Well, they thought I worked for Tony. I said, no, I don't. And uh, actually, one of Tony's staff members came over and said, hey, you're doing a great job with these guys. Let me give you a radio. Need anything? Call me. So they would need water. They'd need more chairs. I'd just call them. They'd bring it over. And to reward me, and I didn't expect nothing in return, they said, hey, I know you've got a general admission seat, but you can sit anywhere in the front two rows that you want to sit. So I sat down on the front row, and I'm sitting there, you know, fully consumed with my pitiful story, you know, poor pitiful me. And I'm sitting next to a guy, and I uh, strike up a conversation with him. He's just got on, you know, some jeans, a T-shirt. No big deal, right? I said, so, so what do you do? He said, oh, I created this little fighting company called UFC. Imagine that, national world brand. And then the guy next to me on the other side, I said, hey, what do you do? He said, oh, I created a little shoe company called Zappos. Maybe, ladies, you've heard of Zappos, one of the biggest shoe companies in the world. So I see these people that are just like me sitting next to me. So we start the event. You know, Tony's getting you motivated. He's working through all this tragedy that you go through in life and you know, a lot of people, especially in Alabama, because we're in the Bible Belt, said, oh, don't go. It's a cult. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. So I'm sitting there. Nobody told me that I had to walk barefoot on hot coals. So when Tony said, take your shoes off, we're going to go outside. I had this uh-oh moment. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about this. But, you know, he's like, oh, come on. It's going to be great. So we go outside, and I hear the drums play, and I see the smoke. I'm like, yeah, it's a cult. I don't know what I've got myself into. So I get there, but it was the it was a destiny awaiting me. I got moved about 20 different lanes. So I'm thinking this is God saying, Hey, put your shoes back on, go back to Alabama. But by design, I ended up in Tony's lane, which typically is just people that are, you know, part of his, you know, partnership, people that have paid big, big money tickets to get there. And Tony gets me to walk across these coals. And when I got to the other side, my destiny was waiting on me. I got to go backstage and meet Tony and talk with him. And he inspired me to, to go out and write a book to share. And I never thought about really sharing my message. So, so I wrote my book. He said, I have an event in Arizona in a month. I want you to come to it, but you can't come to it unless your book is published. So the book got published the day before I went to the event. And he said, I want you to go to a speaker's boot camp." I said, you know, I was honest. I said, I don't have the money to go. Tony paid for me to go to Las Vegas and train with some of the, the world, most world renowned speaking coaches. You know, I was in there with people that were billionaires, millionaires. Um, one girl was making six figures in blogging. This was back way before anybody else was making money doing blogging. And it just showed me that, you know, you can accomplish anything you want in life. So I show up to Arizona and um, I'm out there in the crowd enjoying the event. I get a tap on the shoulder. 
there's 10,000 people there. It's being translated, you know, in over 20 different languages because there's people from all the world. This is his marquee event. And they said, hey, Tony didn't have a speaker to show up. He wants you to get up and share your story. I was like, uh, okay. So I get up and I share my story and kind of the rest was history from there and came back and you know, started speaking. You know, I speak at a lot of a lot of schools, conferences, a lot of Zoom meetings. And I just love to share my message. And, you know, from that, I got into coaching. You know, I have two wonderful kids now. My son's just turned 18. He's a senior, graduates here in a few weeks. And my daughter's 13. And, you know, been able to speak, you know, to so many different groups and organizations and been able to coach and, you know, share my life. You know, I always wanted to be the father to kids that didn't have a father. So that's what got me into coaching you know, uh, sports, you know, I coach football, soccer, you know, people that went on to play in the NFL. And, you know, I'll get text messages from these guys, grown men, you know, happy Father's Day, coach, you know, because they never had a dad, but they had somebody that believed in them. Uh, I, th I think one of probably my biggest accomplishments in life was taking a kid who, sh who would come watch our practice every day, riding a bicycle barefoot, had raggedy clothes on. And I asked him, I said, why don't you play football? He said, coach, my family don't have the money because this was a time where you had to buy your own gear. So we got some parents together, got some loaned out equipment, got some money together, bought him some equipment and shoes. And I saw that guy a couple of years ago in a store. And now his son is playing and that guy has a six figure job. He said, coach, by you believing in me, it made me believe in myself. So sometimes guys, you just got to show people that they can believe in theirself. And, you know, do I get people to, to call me names, to doubt me? Absolutely. Uh, when I got into real estate, I had a lady when I was running real estate ads said, well, you probably don't need to run an ad with your, with your picture because it may make people not want to call you because you look different. My response to her was, well, I think I have a face that everybody's going to recognize. And it never failed. If I went into you know, the local Walmart, the local grocery store, people say, oh, you're that real estate guy. So guys, don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot become because you decide your future. And I always say this, you know, and, and Tony shared this with me, that your past does not equal your future. You know, you can learn from your past, but don't let it hold you back. You know, we've been through stuff in, in our life and our family that we've used to propel us and, and grow us uh, to help other people. You know, sometimes you're on a path and things you've been through was preparing you for your destiny. You know, you can't build a house without a foundation. And sometimes those events that happen in your life was allowing you to build a foundation to stand upon so that you can stand against things that are wrong, so that you can speak out and help people, so that you can share. Because how can you help someone if you hadn't been through those situations? You know, so it's so powerful to be able to share your testimony. And I tell people, sometimes your trials that you're going through right now is just going to be your testimony. And it's all up to you how you overcome that. So I hope me just sharing that snippet of my life it has helped you guys. And Gary, I'd like to give it back to you. And you guys ask me any questions that you have. Yes, sir. Let me see. Bring me back up here. Great stuff. Just lovely, lovely, lovely. Yes. Um, so anybody want to ask some questions before you say yes and think about it? Let me ask um, a question to Billy. I think one of the things that really, really prevent people from having more success, however you want to define success, is they're too, so too overly, overly, overly concerned about what other people think. I would imagine that you have done an amazing job overcompensating for that, if you will, because of what people have said. And you've been so conditioned that people look and stare and say and whatever. Um, what now has created an amazing advantage for you where if the average person who is normal is looked at and stared upon people like, what are you looking at type of thing where that's just like water off a duck's back for you. So mm -hmm. what, what huge lesson is, is in there for people and how has it helped you attain more success and cause you just to keep going forward and not let crap like that get in your head? Yeah. You know, something I had to learn in life is most people don't give a crap about you. You know, a lot of times we, you know, have this story playing in our head that, you know, what does so-and-so think? All that, all that Brad is thinking of is Brad. All that Susie is thinking of really is Susie. They're not thinking about you. You know, the world wants you to believe that, but they're more concerned than consumed. If you don't believe it, just get on social media. 
and see how consumed everybody are. They're, they're consumed about their, their their lives. You know, I see people every day with these phones where, you know, uh, parents, you know, if they were concerned as much about their kids as they were about who's doing what on Facebook, TikTok, or right. Instagram, they would have a wholesome family. If they were more concerned about their spouse than they were about everybody else's life on TikTok or, or any any platform, they'd have a great relationship. You know, so I had to learn that people really don't care about you. And, and if they're looking at you, they're thinking, you know, judging you, they don't pay my bills. They don't have the same vision as me. They don't have the purpose put on their life that I had put on me, you know, because, you know, everybody has opinion, but you don't have to accept that opinion. And usually when somebody's thinking negative about you, that's just them trying to cover up something that's negative in their life. So it's easy to set back and, you know, and I have this conversation with my kids, quit worrying about what everybody thinks because tomorrow, 30 minutes from now, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you think about yourself, what you believe in yourself. And that starts with positive affirmations. You know, what do you, what do you, A, what do you speak to yourself? B, what do you listen to? And C, what do you read? And what, what do you, because your eyes and your ears is your gatekeeper to your mind and your heart. You know, every morning when I'm getting ready, I've got a little app on my phone that plays a, a, a usually eight to 10 minute snippet of a book. You know, and I always say, you know, great audio book a day. You know, last, Last year, I did 280 books in a year, you know, audio, and not, not counting what I read on top of that. So I tell people, you know, just like a great fighter, how does Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson, any of these guys, how did they get to the level of success of Kobe Bryant? Because they outprepared over everybody else. Yeah. You know, when you get up at 5 a.m., they were up at 2.30. You know, when they were on the way to a match. They were already preparing, watching film on their opponent. They knew more about their opponent than the opponent knew about themselves. Yeah. So think, think about, you know, when, when you, people are looking at you and staring at you, just smile at them. Sometimes you never know when you're going to have an impact on their life. Me, you never know what they're going through. So when people are judging you, they're just judging based on their lack and their insecurities that they have. So I encourage you to not take it personal. You know, and I have people say a lot of rude things to me, especially on imagine. different platforms. I have people, you know, always put comments and stuff like this. And I always just send back to them. Love you. You know, they, and of course they never respond back because it startles them because they All want right. you to try to defend your, your appearance or your thought process. And, and if you want haters, you want naysayers, share it with people closest to you that don't have the same vision as you. You right. know, you have and you have to be careful who you share your vision with because not all the time are they going to, because a lot of times, especially people that are close to you, they're judging you based on who you used to be. They're judging you. Well, little Johnny you used to do this and that business failed or little Johnny, that relationship failed. So you got to be really careful. I, I have a really small inner circle, but then, but I'll go share my message with millions, but my inner circle who, who I, I rely on, who I share things with, is very small because I got tired of the naysayers. I got tired of the negative energy that would come off of people. So I always think about when you go to share, you got to be like, like I talked about the three to five people you hang out with in my story. You got to be around like-minded people yeah. because like-minded is just like trying to swim and somebody's hanging on to your foot. You know, both of you going to drown together. <laughs> so true no that's good stuff anybody with a question take advantage of this time with billy man and again he's transparent you can ask him anything 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 he's so open about it don't be shy today's not the day to be shy for that michael no questions tammy no questions no worries Billy, thank you so, so much. Um, I apologize for not being in touch with you even sooner than this. So let's make sure we, uh, we bridge this together and uh, stay in touch some more. We're going to be uh, doing these uh, events on a monthly basis, but we're just getting started. So it's going to be a while to, to build it up and all, but we'll definitely stay in touch. And uh, when I fly by your area, we're going to have to land and um, say hi and definitely keep the ball moving here. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Eric. Thank you guys. Have a blessed day. Billy, stay blessed, my friend. Love you, bro. Love, brother. Talk okay. soon. Huh? Billy, you still there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Michael? Yeah. Hey, um, I got my camera off right now. I'm doing doing my treadmill, so I don't want to get distracted. 
<laughs> speaking. Um, a question for you, Billy. I'm just curious. It sounded like uh, this happened when you were four years old. Is that correct? Two years old. Two years old. Wow. And you had the wherewithal to decide how you wanted to do surgery. Um, pretty amazing. Thank you, by the way, for sharing. I was curious, what would you say was the impact that your mother made uh, on you as a child? Because it seemed like she was a real fighter and it seemed like she was the first real angel as opposed to your dad who walked away. Right. So I'm curious as to how important that was, you know, what sort of impact it made on you. Michael, thank you. That's, and I'll share this with you. You know, me and my cousin were the same accident he was burned i was you know his mom my mom and show you the difference in the two he was raised with a victim mindset mindset mm. it was always poor pitiful for me maybe you know just let everybody feel sorry for you and guess what he ended up you know dropping out of school he ended up you know going to jail in and out of jail in and out of relationships kids that he doesn't even take care of whereas my mom said you're not going to feel sorry for yourself there's nothing wrong with you she said, there's a purpose on your life and you're going to believe in and live that purpose. So she pushed me. There was the word handicap never used in our house. You know, mm -hmm. I had to get out. I had to work on a farm. If you if you need to learn how to use your fingers, go shell peas and butter beans. You'll learn real quick <laughs> how to use all. I had to cut grass, you know, uh, everything. You know, there, there was never every Saturday morning was spring clean the house, you know, cleaning baseboards and so she made me believe in myself, even when I didn't believe in myself. That was probably the biggest takeaway. Sometimes you got to believe for somebody else until they start to believe on their own. So by her having that no quit attitude, that gave me that attitude. Love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, Billy, thanks again. If we don't have any more questions, we'll stay in touch. And um, I will uh, reach out to you again. Okay, buddy? All right, brother. Thank you. Take care. Thank you kindly for your time, bro. Love you. So I thought I would uh, bring Billy on. How many of you found that to be quite um, inspiring? Yeah. And, you know, when you listen to him in this moment, you begin to realize maybe my problems aren't so friggin' bad, even though, you know, we got we all have our problems, but at least how we look at things, you know, we all have problems, but how we look at things. So that was my my main reason for bringing him on, just to give you a spark to look at things differently. Uh, knowing that there's hope out there, no matter what the challenges are that we go through, even though there's times uh, we may not believe that. And he's just a, a great inspiration. Uh, if you're following me on Instagram, I just posted a story to follow him. But let me get you the uh, Instagram to follow Billy. It's just uh, Billy J. Brown, I believe it is. Let me get the picture that I just posted. Yeah, Billy Jane Brown underscore inspires. Billy j billy j sorry billy j brown underscore inspires give him a shout out okay dokie my friends this concludes our first move toward emotional freedom challenge and i look forward to hopefully seeing you again starting on monday we're starting to promote the next one which will be may 15th if you want to make a note of that may 15th we do have an early bird special so it's 50 percent off uh for a, a certain amount of time so if you have friends families colleagues that you think they would benefit um hopefully you would be able to share this with them we'd certainly appreciate that here as well thank you for my team camille latoya freen all nate everybody involved in helping putting this together and I will have the Facebook group open for another couple of days. I think we we'll be closing that down probably around Tuesday. And then we'll open up another one for those who get into the next challenge, challenge two for May. All right, everybody, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll connect also again on social media. If you're not doing so, I'd love to connect with you. So definitely please make sure you do that, whether it be on Instagram or Facebook. And until then, keep working hard toward your goals. Appreciate you. Love you guys. See you.